take a question from the uh, from the screen here, and I'll address it to you, Scott. Uh, I, I don't necessarily expect you to have the answer, but uh, it, it's the $64 question. How do we address the gulf between science on the one hand and ideology and opinion on the other? <laughs> As a, from a scientist's point of view, do you, do you feel that the public debate has become uh, overtaken by those who have an opinion? Uh, they reckon that this is what we should do rather than... A debate based upon evidence and if so is there something that scientists could do better perhaps to influence that public opinion? I must admit if you asked me where we would be now I would have thought that um, there wouldn't be very much debate about the human role in climate change or the seriousness of the threat but um, to be honest I, about five say five six seven years ago I thought gee I'm gonna have to start thinking about something else to do but it's actually been very much the reverse, that there's a huge demand for, still a huge demand for this sort of information because people are genuinely, many people are genuinely confused because there are two major sources of information. One is from established scientific agencies that includes, you know, the agency, scientific agencies within the United Nations, uh, CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, and all of the learned societies around the world. Virtually, well, I'm not aware of any of those societies, like, say, the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society, the equivalent in the US, the Royal Society in England, the, the oldest in the world. They all say the same thing, the sorts of things that I was saying before. Um, but at the same time, you have people who are contradicting that, questioning it, which is their right, but um, they do seem to have an awful sway within the broader, broader community. Um, so as a scientist, all I can do is just keep providing the information. I think um, to go beyond that takes, takes more than just scientists working within the federal public service. It requires a, a broader spectrum of people involved to, to um, get people to recognise how serious the threat actually is. There, there were press uh, reports and I think articles by a number of people, and one of them, Morris Newman, who's the Prime Minister's business advisor, who argued that scientists have a self-interest in promoting uh, climate change hysteria, if you like, to, to run up uh, research monies and, and get financing from, from government. How, how do scientists view those sort of claims? Well, I don't want to talk about individuals, but um, it's, it's, virtually, <laughs> it's virtually impossible to counter that. I mean, if someone accuses you of being self-interested, you can't actually respond effectively. It's for others to draw their own opinions. Because, you know, if I see someone say, uh, I was going to say politician, I better think of another example. Um, former politician, no. Well, let's suppose a politician, if, I, if someone was to accuse them of being self-interested, it's difficult for that politician to, to counter that. You know, it requires an independent third party or friends or colleagues to, to assist that person. And I think we're in the same, potentially in the same sort of situation. I mean, it is a fact that we, we conduct research, we need funding to conduct that research. But one thing that doesn't come out often is that um, if I could disprove the human role in climate change, if I could show you that the threat is grossly exaggerated, then I would do it because I would become the most famous scientist in, one of the most famous scientists in the history of the world. And that's a major motivation for many, many scientists. I mean, there's also, you know, do the right thing and... Uh, you know, that's the main objective, but, you know, scientists are self-interested, but that's where the self-interest lies, I think, the primary self-interest. Adam, do you have some comments on the role of so-called clim climate deniers? Yeah, well, uh, one of the things is that it's been shown time and time again that giving people more science, the general public, doesn't change their opinion on these things. Their people's opinions are formed by their values. And so what we need to do is we need to understand we've got to have this robust science. This is fundamental to making these choices. And then we need educated groups of people in the, in the, in the population who really want to change something within their community. And this can be firemen, this can be nurses, this can be the building industry, this can be any of these industries who people then see the value of doing of changing this. And so what can happen, and I think for the building industry, this is really interesting, is that pumping more science on climate change, global warming, and, and, and what is happening on the science on the front page of, of, a, of a building development is not going to work. But building a building that people really love and love living in, and oh, by the way, cuts our emissions by 80%, 
is, is, the really, is the strong message because it's building on people's values of what they want on a day-to-day -day lifestyle basis. And I think that is one of the key things that we sort of miss with this, that as scientists, we're always trying to tell people more information. And actually, more information is overwhelming sometimes. Talking about values is really, really key and really important. And those graphs that, that you were showing, Scott, really show that our values will have to change because we're going to be start dealing with a very, very different material environment that we're living in. So I think that's one of the, the key bits of getting around this ideology thing about climate change, non-climate change. Don't even say anything about climate change. Just talk about what it means to live in a really great place that happens to be low carbon. To my Matt? mind, John. There's, there's a level at which there's a responsibility to engage um, both at a political level and a corporate level with the general public, but there's also a responsibility not to engage. If you were to go up to anyone in, I will challenge, any one of the states uh, across Europe or the UK who are currently in the emissions trading scheme and ask Joe Public on the road, what do you think of the emissions trading scheme? They'll tell you, what's an emissions trading scheme? No one knows because it's an irrelevant fact it's a policy mechanism put into place because of robust science that indicates that governments need to do something. The same is true for corporations. If you are in the business of developing properties and you know that those assets are going to be there for 40, 50, 60, however many years you hope that they'll be there, if you are not building in the resilience into those buildings and maximizing the opportunities from policy opportunities that are available to you today, including the incentive schemes, including um, avoiding disincentives, then you really aren't doing the right thing by the people who have ownership in your business and you aren't doing the right thing at a political level um, from, the, from your own electorate. So in some ways, the discourse, to my mind, has been two grassroots. Um, you know, we are challenging every piece of science at a basic level when actually the science is very complicated. It's very complicated and very difficult to explain. And Scott did an incredible job in 20 minutes of putting hundreds if not thousands of researchers' works together and informing of what that means over the long term. That's very complicated science. It's very difficult to discuss at, at, at a public level. And I, I don't actually think we need to do that. This, 